Welcome to Adventures in Grace. This is Jim Hockaday. I know the last time you saw me, I was on exactly in this position, exactly in this shirt. <laughs> I know. I told you that I had to do a couple videos back to back, and I'm heading out real early in the morning, 5.50 flight, you know, to head from uh, Denver over to Columbia, South Carolina. So uh, I'm just going to jump right back in here where we were. That's why I said see you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> I know it's been a couple of days. <clears throat> Anyhow, oh, isn't God good? Praise the Lord. This is an interesting subject matter. I trust you're enjoying it. Let me know if you are. I always want to just put up there, and of course, uh, maybe we can, sorry about that, maybe we can uh, put on the screen, and, and I haven't looked at these since Chloe's been doing it, and maybe she has been, but jhmi at jimhockaday.com, the email to our website, jimhockaday.com, so that you would go there and write us your grace stories. You say, well, mine is just that, you know, I got an amazing parking spot, and someone pulled out at the exact time I pulled in. There were people behind me, so they could have gotten it. And it was so wonderful because it was getting ready to rain. And sure enough, I made it in without even getting a drop of rain on me. So you think, well, I'm not going to write that in. Oh, no, please write that in. Because as simple as God working with you in the very minute areas of your life is, every one of them is an encouragement and opens someone else's heart to the idea, if God can do that for them, then God can do that for me. And so it's important for us to embellish every little uh, convenience of God, every little coincidence, every little working of God, because the more that we do, the more we invite him to become a part of everything we do, and our experiences increase and increase, not only in quality, but in quantity. So by all means, do so. Now, we're going to jump into um, the sightseeing theory. I think some of you are well-versed with it now. I'll just run over it very quickly. But before we do, number one, we do these videos for God to come out of the pages of your Bible and get into your life. Everybody wants that. Number two, we do these videos so that the realness of God will make faith become more natural and you'll have more fortitude to actually know you're receiving what you ask for and you get answers to your prayers. Number three, that you would have testimonies to share with one another. Now, our verse of scripture that we always use, I always want to give it because it sets the stage for everything that we're doing. Matthew 11, 27 to 30 in the Message Bible. Now, Jesus resumed talking, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father and son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son like the father does, nor the father like the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Praise the Lord. That's a great passage. Go there, spend some time there. And maybe, maybe a few, uh, maybe the next month we'll pick up on that particular passage and talk about that for two or three days ourselves. So here we are, the sightseeing theory. It's all about your, your hunger, your desire, your curiosity, your passion that moves you to have God or have more of God than you've had at this point. Moves you to continue to pursue until you understand and experience and then begin to regularly experience God in your life. And they say, why are you talking about this? Because people approach life completely different in myriad of different ways. Some people, they want everything of God. Others, as long as they can just get to the building, they're fine because, you know, hey, check me off, I made it. Other people, they're there and then they're gone. And other people, they have frivolous ideas. You know, they just think of maybe their favorite service. I sure hope the service is like this. Oh, it's not, he's gonna teach today, so I'm not gonna listen. You see, everybody has different mannerisms that they bring into a church service or into a relationship with God, and based on how they see it with their glasses, whether they're clear or colored, they receive multitude of different things from the service, and meaning nothing at all. So as we're looking at this, we're talking about and have been reading over in Matthew 27, 1 through 7, 
And of course, it's talking about Jesus is saying, hey, there's religious Pharisees and scholars. They're good with the law, but don't follow their lives. They don't, they don't, uh, they're, they're messed up. You know, they just want, they want public flattery, honorary degrees, getting called a doctor and reverend, sitting at the, at the most perfect place, everybody bowing down to them, you know, feeling like they're somebody and you're nothing. I'm a man of God. Who are you? Well, if I'm a man of God, aren't you a man of God? Aren't you a woman of God? Aren't you a child of God? I do not like it when someone says, oh, the man of God. It's like, really? We're all God's children. I know I'm a minister. There is an element of respect for that. But let me earn that respect. Give me an opportunity to minister and show you the presence and power of God. Terminologies, titles, that's for another day. Verse 8, 12 in Matthew 23, if we go on, says, don't let people do you like that, put you on a pedestal like that. You all have a single teacher and you are all classmates. I like that, see. Don't set people up as experts over your life, letting them tell you what to do. Save that authority for God. Let him tell you what to do. No one else should carry the title of father. You have only one father and he's in heaven. Don't let people maneuver you into taking charge of them. There is only one life leader for you and them, and it's Christ. Do you want to stand out? Then step down. Be a servant. If you puff yourself up, you'll get the wind knocked out of you. But if you're content to be simply yourself, your life will count for plenty. You see, Paul in the epistles did a really good job in this next verse I give you of showing you that it's important to get yourself out of your own way. And those verses that I gave you show you just that. Individuals that are all puffed up about the wrong thing and they're in their own way. God can't work through them because they can't even work through themselves. They're not simple enough. They're not honest enough. They're not real enough to the person that they really are. I like what Paul said here about how destructive it was to be in the way because Galatians 2.20, he said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's, not, it's no longer I that live. See, that's it right there. Why did Paul see himself as though he wasn't living? So that he wouldn't make the bad choices, the wrong choices, and make the, make the mistakes of putting himself again, once and for all, right back into the law, right underneath the flesh, and put himself in bondage. Paul continued to keep himself in the power of the Spirit by seeing that Paul had died. And now the one that was living inside of him, like the distilled translation said, is just Jesus using my body. And here in the King James, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Paul's recognizing everything going forward is about Jesus living in me. And there's nothing about me. It's all about him. Now, I respond to this. But the way that I see it is with tunnel vision. I'm not looking at the world. I'm not looking at my life behind me or in front of me. I'm seeing only Christ and I'm allowing him to live his life in me. Your best life is Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27. Praise the Lord. So now I'm over in Acts chapter 26, 17 to 18. And I, I think you'll see where this begins to work with what we're talking about. I'm sending you off to open the eyes of the outsiders so that they can see the difference between dark and light. Choose light. See the difference between Satan and God and choose God. I'm sending you off to present my offer of sins forgiven and a place in the family, inviting them into the company of those who begin real living by believing in me. Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? Notice the distinctions that are made here. And this is so important that we live a life full of distinctions. This is and this isn't. This is wrong. This is right. This is black. This is white. This is good. This is bad. This is Christ. This is Satan. This is a believer. This is an unbeliever. This is a temple of God. This is the temple of Satan. Why do I want to live that way? Because it's easier to make better choices. Come on, when Jesus talked over in Revelation that he's not real fond of lukewarm, it's better to be hot or to be cold, what he was trying to say is it making a good choice comes from a distinction. If you put cold and hot together to make it lukewarm, what people do is they validate their wrong by a little bit of right. When you look at things accurately through hot or cold, it's a, it's a distinctive decision that is separated by a complete 180 degrees 
from the other decision that you could make. Now, if I said that correctly, you got that. In other words, I'll say it like this, and I've said this before, and people, you know, they, they probably get, oh, I can't believe you said that. But really, a honky-tonk, a strip joint, and a meth lab is really a good place. And you say, why is it a good place? Because it's all bad. There's nothing good about it. In other words, when something's all bad, you go, oh, I don't want that. If something's all good, you go, oh, 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 I want that. I mean, smell those cookies coming out of the oven. And do you think, no, I don't want that. No, no, no. You, you, you are trying to take one before they've cooled. Why? Because they smell so good, it's all good, and I want it. Now, I'm not talking about if you're a nutritionist, I realize you could say, well, there's sugar in there, and there's, you know, yes, I get, I get all that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the fact that it's a, it's a thing that you desire greatly that is, oh, why am I even getting into discussion? That's not bad. Anyhow, it's when something's all the way bad. Hey, put your hand in this jar. There's a bunch of bumblebees that want to sting you. No, I'm not going to do that. There's a bunch of scorpions in there. They're going to kill you. No. But when there's enough good to validate a lot of bad, and what I just said to you is how most people in the world live their lives. They live their lives in majority of bad and negativity, and every once in a while, there's a little bit of good that causes them to feel like the sun will come out tomorrow. And that's how people live their lives. Now, what is there about that life that seems to be the life that Jesus Christ died for to give us? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to go on even a little bit further down here to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. And here comes the hail again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves or your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable uh, to God, which is your reasonable service. And so do not be conformed uh, unto this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Well, I want to read this out of the Message Bible because it's really, really, really good. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Now listen to the words here. We're going to see what I just got through talking about, about the hot and the cold and the lukewarm. He said here next, embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. In other words, not helping him out, embracing what he does. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Hello, I actually believe there's probably more of this in us than we realize. And asking the Lord for discernment between right and wrong. I'll just throw this out. I don't know why, but for years and years and years as a little kid over in Proverbs, I read where it said, you know, having discernment between right and wrong. And every single night before I went to bed, I prayed, Father, give me discernment between right and wrong. That's not a bad thing to pray for. Lord, open my eyes that I can see. Grant unto me understanding that I can understand the hope of your calling, the glorious riches of your inheritance and the greatness of your mighty power. What's Paul trying to do? He's trying to help people to realize you can come up out of what you've been seeing and see something totally different that'll change your life. He goes on to say, you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down uh, to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you. He develops well maturity in you. And then, of course, I like this over here in Ephesians chapter 4, 20 and 24. Just verses of scripture now that are helping us with this whole idea of what motivates you. And then that motivation that's in you, how far does it take you? Are you seeing the whole Grand Canyon or just one little spot? And, and recognizing that I'm fitting too much into my culture around me and not embracing the things that are before me or presenting my life as a sacrifice unto God every day. Maybe I'm being duped. Maybe I don't even know it. And I'm reveling in the few little good things that are happening and there's much more negative than I could think of. <clears throat> These are all wonderful things 
to contemplate everybody. This is not a harsh message. It's just the more accurate and the more absolute the message becomes, the more it pins our hide to the wall and makes us really think. And then what comes out of our thinking is our choosing. We then have to choose. What do you mean you have to choose? Well, that's exactly right. We've got to make choices. And those choices are important that they either connect us to God. Sorry, I'm looking for just that one particular part there. They either connect us to God or they don't. A bad choice. I wrote this down. A bad choice equals sin. Sin becomes your hindrance to your connection with God. Wait a minute, I thought sin wasn't a hindrance. No, 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 he's already paid for your sin. Sin's already under the blood. It's not hindering God working with you. But a bad choice puts you in a bad position, takes you away from the tangibility of God, brings to light the tangibility of the flesh and the world, and that becomes your hindrance to the unseen world. See, the idea that Jesus said to the disciples in Mark chapter 9, this kind comes out talking about that devil coming out. This kind comes out by prayer and fasting. What he's trying to say is prayer and fasting is what sensitizes you to the spiritual things or to the spiritual world. And the spiritual world being real, then your operation in that spiritual world becomes very natural. And out of the natural operation in the spiritual world, answers to prayers become, of course, they become just a norm. Not something that you are just pleading with or begging God for, but something that's just expected, natural, regular, every day. See, bad choices put you in line with or in focus with the flesh and the world. Yes, it's already covered through Jesus Christ, so God can still work with you. Well, I don't believe that God's not going to, you know, he's not going to forgive you if you don't forgive. That's under old covenant. That's under the old covenant. Someone you want to argue with this, it's under the old covenant. I'm just telling you, you're wrong if you think that's under the new covenant. Yes, we are to walk in forgiveness. And your reason why we're to walk in forgiveness with one another is because we're walking under the law of love. But God has already forgiven you. So whether you've forgiven someone or not, he's there to forgive you. And he is there, praise the Lord, to work with you and bless you because he's already forgiven you. Under the old covenant, they weren't forgiven. So see, it was under the law. Come on, it either is or isn't, everybody. Well, man, I think you still have to walk in forgiveness to have God work with you. Well, then you're working by your works. So how do you know that you've asked God to forgive you of everything you're supposed to be forgiven from so that your slate is clean so that God can work with you? Well, I guess I don't, do I? No. That's the reason why Jesus cleaned your slate. Jesus wiped your sins as far as the east and from the west so that he could remove the obstacle from you. Now, walking in love is one of the greatest things that you can do with one another. And remember, bad choices to be in a place of unforgiveness with somebody is not that you can't appropriate your healing, but the more you entangle yourself with the flesh and the world and negativity, the more that becomes a hindrance to your faith. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Okay, let's go a little further here. I'm just going to leave that one alone. And oh, it's already. I'll tell you what, we'll have one more of these, okay? And I'll go ahead and give you the next testimony that we have. It's really good. It says, My Grace Stories That I Discovered, The Adventures in Grace video series after seeing your interview on the Victory Channel with Kelly Copeland's show during a time of great challenges. The Lord made it clear to me that I should listen to the first series, Real Christianity. And there, in part eight, I found the following words which have become very precious. Stop trying to figure it out. Just trust God. In other words, if you're willing to lose something, that's when you can have it. If you're willing to die, that's when you can really live. And if you're willing to be wrong, that's when you can be right. When you just give up, that's when God takes over. People have asked me for years, how come it seems like God seems to take so long to heal somebody? And I share with them, well, it doesn't take God long. It just takes long for people to get out of the way until God can move in and do something. And then she said, ouch, 
I know that's not necessarily fun, but that's a result of the religion. And the reason why we're sharing these things is to remove you from the old mindset about how much you got to do to impress God so that he's finally going to do something for you that he already did in Christ 2,000 years ago. And I don't know how he can impress you any more than to have Jesus hang on a cross and blood to pour through his body because he was willing to take the bondage of your sickness and your pain and to take all your oppression from the enemy upon his life so that he would die, go to hell and remove it all and raise you up to live like he is living right now in the purity and holiness and the freedom from sickness and disease and pains and struggles and the crisis of life so that even when crisis comes to your relationship with God, our relationship with God will cause you to put up a front, resist it and continue to walk in the blessing the peace and the health and deliverance of the Lord. And then she said, in spite of recent challenges, there have been great grace stories as well. When my heating broke down last winter, I had to heat the wood stove. My supply of firewood lasted exactly until the end of the heating season. And then she talks about living in another country and uh, some things concerning some of the work that she does so wonderfully for ministries concerning translating books and all. And thank the Lord for that. Thank you so much for that grace story. It just shows us, amen, God will lead you to the right place at the right time to experience the most wonderful and right thing. Well, the last two videos, I've gone to 21 minutes, and I'm sorry about that. Next video, we're going to go just 17 minutes, because I tell people they're from 17 to 20. So I want to go ahead and do a 17-minute video next time. Hey, you guys, I appreciate you so much. Remember, go to jhmi at jimhockaday.com and send us your grace stories. See you later.